1994, four of the leading directors at Pixar Animation Studios all met for lunch one afternoon at the now famous Hidden Cafe near Pixar's original headquarters in Point Richmond, California. At first, the leading directors may have thought this meeting would be like any other. However, the conversation they had that one afternoon in 1994 would end up drastically changing the future of children's animation forever. At one point or another, most film enthusiasts, I'm looking at you, have tried to come up with an idea for a movie, thinking they could become the next Tarantino or George Lucas. We have all dreamt of our idea of getting picked up by a major studio with a massive budget, maybe starring 90s Leo, Margot Robbie, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, and fuck it, let's throw in Liam Neeson just for fun. I do have are a very particular set of skills. I hate to break it to you all, but for most of us, our ideas will likely never become a blockbuster success, and our dreams will forever remain dreams. I know this might seem harsh, but this is the reality of the film industry. Don't be too hard on yourself. This harsh reality even affects some major studios. For instance, every year, at least one film seems to have everything needed to become a huge box office hit. It has a star-studded cast, a massive budget, and it's promoted everywhere and on everything. But despite all these factors, the film tanks and loses millions of dollars. Sometimes, even the studio that supported that film can never fully recover from its failure. So, this brings me back to the one meeting with Pixar's creators at the Hidden Cafe in 1994, where all four people sat down and had one conversation. In this meeting, they wanted to create a plan to follow up on the already established idea for the company's first full feature-length film, Toy Story. In only a couple of hours, four people came up with more ideas than most film creators dream of creating in a lifetime. By brainstorming some thoughts and saying to each other, what if, they came up with the ideas for A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, and WALL-E. All four films would become huge box office successes, and some would end up becoming considered amongst the greatest animation films ever. The point is, it's hard to create any idea that is even remotely successful in the film industry, let alone four of the most successful films of the decade in one meeting between four people in one afternoon. After Pixar created these four films, the production company went on to become the leading force in the genre of children's animation, with works such as The Incredibles, Inside Out, Cars, and Ratatouille, among countless others. The resume speaks for itself. I could spend hours and hours talking about each and every one of Pixar's accomplishments, but that's not what I want to talk about today. Today, I want to talk about why Pixar films have become so successful, what is it about Pixar films that make them so significant, and how Pixar films stand out amongst the rest of the children's animation genre. Well, first off, it must be pointed out that during the time when Pixar first made their film Toy Story, they had the best animation technology in the industry. Although Toy Story was Pixar's first feature-length film, they had been pioneering computer animation since the late 70s. Initially, the company was called the Computer Division and was a part of Lucasfilm, working on projects like the first digital nonlinear editing software and early CGI concepts. Fast forward to 1995, and Pixar was now its own company, teaming up with Disney Studios to create their film Toy Story. We'll read out yet if the air is breathable, and there seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. Hello? Oh, yeah. ah! which became the world's first computer animated feature film and was also the highest grossing film of the year. And from then on, I guess you can say... To infinity and beyond! So yeah, I guess in the 90s, no other animation studio even came close to the level of animation technology that Pixar had at their disposal, which gave them a huge competitive advantage. To make things fair, Let's fast forward to the mid-2000s, when companies such as DreamWorks and Sony eventually caught up to a level playing field of animation technology. Sure, companies such as DreamWorks created excellent animation films, including Shrek 1 and 2, and How to Train Your Dragon, just to name a few examples. Still, for all the successes companies like DreamWorks had, they had just as many failures. 
All the while, Pixar remained consistently dominant, both critically and commercially, churning out classic after classic. One thing that often gets overlooked when considering Pixar's early success is that the film Toy Story did demonstrate the beginning of a new era with computer-generated animation technology. But it was also the first ever animated film to be nominated for an Oscar for Best Screenplay. So clearly, there's something more going on here than just good technology. That brings me to the main reason for Pixar's success, and it starts with aesthetic imagination. Okay, brace yourself, because this may seem very complex at first, but it's pretty intuitive. And once you understand it, you will always be able to recognize it, and you'll notice it everywhere. I first found this concept in Eric Herhuth's book, Pixar and the Aesthetic Imagination. In his book, Eric Herhuth, like most of us, recognized that Pixar films were just different compared to other children's animation films. Although other studios were capable of creating great works, Pixar seemed to have a perfect code in which all their films followed. And following that code was why all their movies were so consistently excellent. So, where does Pixar's fundamental code of understanding animation come from? Well, there are two certainties of children's animation. First, and this is true for all animation, there is what Herhuth calls explicit artificiality. To understand this concept, let's do a thought exercise. Ask yourself this. What is the difference between animation and live action cinema? Why do we even create animation in the first place? Is it just another genre? Eh, wrong. Animation is more than just another genre of film. In fact, before the days of CGI, animation was the only way that directors could have complete creative freedom to manipulate every single individual frame of their work. On the contrary, in live action films, cameras capture reality and the filmmakers attempt to manipulate and change that reality to help create their vision. But they have nowhere close to as much control as animation directors do, because animation directors literally create their own realities for their projects. Since animation gives filmmakers the ability to create their own worlds, characters, and perspectives with complete freedom, this makes the medium more than just another genre of film. It also explains why children love animation films so much, because they can let their imagination run wild when they watch it. The other certainty of children's animation is what Herhuth calls stylized realism. Although the directors of children's animation films have seemingly unlimited creative freedom, their films must be confined within the grounds of realism. Why? Because for the kids, there must be a point of reference or something related to real experience that helps kids understand the film's perspective. For instance, although many Pixar films explore far out concepts, like a world full of monsters or toys coming to life, they still humanize these perspectives to make them relatable. For instance, in Ratatouille, there's one scene where the rat family has a dinner party. There's a little rap band playing in the background, everyone is chatting at tables, and the scene is reminiscent of what most viewers would understand to be a classic dinner party. This is one of countless examples where Pixar grounds its ideas in reality and humanizes an utterly foreign perspective. In this case, Pixar makes us see rats as similar to humans, and therefore the viewer sympathizes with them. A grounding in realism is also vital for children's animation because most parents want their kids to be watching content that teaches their children valuable life lessons and helps them grow up to be better people. Therefore, most children's animation films must teach their viewers a greater lesson about life and how to orient oneself in it. Since children animation must both be artificial yet realistic, this creates what Herhuth describes to be the perfect conditions to destabilize traditional boundaries between experience and existence. He also says that animated films can both create and reimagine the world, which influences how characters see, understand, and act in it. Oftentimes, major studios can strike gold with a film. They buy a fantastic script, hire the right people at the right place and at the right time, and boom, blockbuster hit. But what about if a company doesn't just strike gold once or twice? What if a company consistently strikes gold for 15 years straight? Well, that's what happened with Pixar in the period between 1995 and 2010. Pixar achieved this because they recognized the significance of children's animation as a medium. With the help of aesthetic imagination, they were capable of creating a consistent theme in each of their films. 
the theme of challenging social norms. By deploying the creative capabilities of computer animation to humanize foreign entities, Pixar teaches children to value one's integrity above everything else and to not make initial judgments based on preconceptions. In Ratatouille, the film takes what would be considered one of the most disgusting living animals, a rat, and shows life from that rat's perspective as they attempt to follow their dream of becoming a chef. Through adversity, the rat eventually becomes nothing less than the finest chef in France. Instead of the social norm of finding rats disgusting and losing one's appetite, children watch Ratatouille and root for the rat as he challenges social norms. In Monsters, Inc., we see a world in which monsters behind our closet, which terrify us, are really more scared of us than we are of them. In fact, it turns out that one of those monsters could become our best friend. Again, Pixar humanizes the opposite of a conventional norm, being scared of monsters. By depicting life from the monster's perspective, humanizing them. In Toy Story, when Woody thinks all hope is lost and he is surrounded by the toys that initially terrified him, but, but they're cannibals. We saw them eat those other toys. His expectations are subverted as those creepy toys end up helping him and Buzz save the day and get back home to Andy. Again, Pixar is demonstrating the same theme of subverting expectations or social norms. When Pixar teaches children to see life from the perspective of these characters, it teaches them a valuable lesson. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, all that matters is your integrity and your character. This also isn't just my opinion. In a study done by Fuentes et al., Researchers found that children who watched clips from Pixar films depicting inclusivity were more likely to be open to playing with children of different races and genders than they were before watching. This demonstrates that Pixar films have real-world implications. Whether or not they were aware of it at the time, in that famous lunch meeting at the Hidden Cafe in 1994, four Pixar producers didn't just discuss a bunch of film ideas. They discussed a philosophy of life. One in which, through the capabilities of animation technology, the most unusual what-ifs helped a generation of young children grow up to become better human beings. The films that were designed within that philosophy became some of the best animation films to ever be created and forever change children's animation. So, if you're a young filmmaker, I implore you to find colleagues who share similar values to you and go out for lunch. Have a conversation filled with each of you taking turns saying what if, followed by whatever idea comes to mind. Who knows, you may just create the next Pixar. I'm Finn Lyons, and thanks for listening.